there's so much activity going on as we kick off another edition of This Is Utah from the one and only Olympic Park in Park City. We are surrounded by greatness, and so we decided to showcase some local athletes who are also doing great things too. From the passion and determination of an avid skier who leaves age expectations in the dust, to a young figure skater who is quickly rising in the ranks and raising alarm about inequities in the sport. Plus, we dive into the life and legacy of a basketball legend who changed the game in the 1940s and is still inspiring athletes today. This is Utah is made possible in part by the Willard L. Eccles Foundation, the Lawrence T. and Janet T. D. Foundation, and by the contributions to PBS Utah from viewers like you. Thank you. Gliding gracefully and carving fresh lines, Hall of Fame ski instructor Junior Banus is a living legend. He was an extreme skier before the term was even invented. Today, Junior still shreds the slopes, sharing his secrets to enjoying every twist and turn along the way. I'm like hundreds of other people looking for the first snow and going and, and feeling it again. Every time I drive up Little Cottonwood Canyon, it's a pleasure. Every time I ride a lift to the top of the mountain, it's the same to me today as it did 60 years ago. Marching senior skiers, they quit skiing because they've lost their ski buddies. Yesterday you got, what, six or eight untracked powder runs in? I know it. <laughs> You're back to giggling like a little kid. <laughs> you know, it made me feel like I was 80 again. Yeah. <laughs> So when you and all these other Alta instructors finally mm. developed a, you know, a powder skiing technique for yourselves, then you had to teach it to your students. And one of the ways that I learned how to ski powder from you was being taught how to sing a song. The singing distracts mentally mm -hmm. as well. And then, but it aids rhythm. Counting works like a cadence, mm -hmm. uh, left, right, left, right. And so if you're, if you're feeling a rhythm and a bounce, then you're, you're being aware of what the snow is doing. If, it, if it's really, really ice, yeah. that, that's a very different piece of music. Fear, stiffness, or enemies of, of good skiing. Al Fengen was probably the most influential person on my skiing and philosophy mm -hmm. and being able to communicate and, and ski with people. Well, and that was also a pretty important uh, standard that you, I believe, learned from Alf Engen of hiring people who were ski instructors who were overall nice people and who you knew would be kind to clients more so than their actual ski level. I can train an instructor how to ski and how to teach, but he's, he's always said I can't uh, make up for what their mother didn't teach them yeah. in manners. And <laughs> Junior Benus was the original ski school director for Snowbird when it opened in 1971, which is the year the team started as well. Snowbird ski team and the Benus family are pretty much inseparable in terms of the memories that um, I know I have of the different decades up there. 
Junior was always kind of this larger than life figure that we all knew when we were kids. Steve, of course, was the head coach then, but Junior was always around, always skiing, literally skiing every day. I grew up in a ski school, and there were a lot of people who just wanted to talk about form and technique. Junior's mentality is, let's go have fun. And he'll give you a pointer or two along the way, but at the end of the day, he's about enjoying being in the mountains with friends. And that's why so many people gather and are gravitating to Junior wherever he goes. 95 year Junior. Did you get it? Thanks, Junior. <laughs> Skiing gives you a, a, a feeling between earth and air that gives you a floating sensation. I don't know how to describe that flotation. Back before you had created a powder skiing technique and figured out all of the gear and the skis and stuff, you said we were fighting powder. Learning how to ski powder, it can sometimes feel like you're fighting the powder. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you were able to transition into floating through powder. You know, the biggest help in powder skiing was the development of skis that will float. Jim Chain was the one that came up with ideas. He discovered that instead of sanding the tips, you had to sand the tail. And that's when the tail was soft and it would let the tips float. He said, we've got to move the bindings back and shorten the tail, not just soften it. And that combination, we had powder skis. Junior Benus was jumping off cliffs long before it was cool. He could catch a lot of air and land it smoothly and make it look easy. The pipeline goes to the Twin Peaks, but it's this angle. I was the first one to ski it ever. It's uh, 45, 50 degrees. First time was in 71 when we opened. And then I skied it for my 80th birthday. So Junior knew what could be where Snowbird is today. They used to come over from Alta and ski Peruvian Gulch or even sometimes Gad Valley. As the plan started to come together, Junior was instrumental in figuring out the right place to put the lifts and the runs and how you could make a ski resort work on what is really steep fall line terrain from top to bottom. I had skied this area and knew the terrain from working at Alta. And so I recognized the challenge immediately. Ted Johnson, when he hired me to do it, he said, you go to work, you have the resort open to ski by the middle of December. And I never received another instruction after that. <laughs> he walks in my office at Snowbird and I'll have a map out on the table. And we'll start talking about lift placement and snow making and things we're doing on the map. And he remembers every detail of when that run or that area was first developed. And so I spent my first two or three weeks in an architect's office, looking at topog maps, knowing where cliffs were. Fun days, <laughs> challenging days, yes. And this is a white lupine. And I've only seen two or three plants. One of Maxine's favorite summer hikes, of course, was always wildflowers. In Little Cottonwood Canyon, up here in Mineral Basin. And she liked to take a book and, and try to identify all these flowers. Since her passing, 
snowbird and and Benuses have combined together to build a, a ski bench with Maxine's name on it. We had 70 years together. She skied into her 90s. I've been very thankful that it lasted that long. Southern Utah, it doesn't matter. Colorado, mm -hmm. Utah mountains, alpine terrain, red rock desert. <laughs> It's so beautiful. It yeah. is all en enhancing my I life. Uh, and I will continue it as long as I can. <laughs> <laughs> Members of the Utah Figure Skating Club, of which I am not one, started on an outdoor rink, very similar to the one I'm on right now. A lot has changed since back then in the 1950s. For one, athletes practice indoors, and a new generation of leaders and skaters are reshaping the idea of who belongs on the ice in Utah. I feel like she was made for it. She was quite fearless when she first started. So I guess it wasn't that good of a fun. Most of the time, my mind's kind of blank when I skate. You can be so stressed, and then you step on the ice, and it just like all goes away. It really is impressive. She has not been skating long in the world of figure skating for how much she's accomplished. I'm Elodie Lawson. When I first started skating, I'd see people doing things, not really know anything about the move, but I'd be like, I should try that. Most kids start at like five years old, three years old, but I started at 10. 10 is considered late in figure skating. Sometimes I feel a little guilty because she started asking me when she was probably three. And I just kind of, um, dragged my feet a lot. I knew what she would have to face and what she would have to experience. Being black in Utah um, and having these biracial daughters, I always wanted them to be proud of who they are. I always tried to find people that looked like them. And so I remember taking Elodie <laughs> to California, I went to LA to see Misty Copeland. That inspired her. We joined the Utah Figure Skating Club, which is actually the oldest skating club in Utah. The club was dying. There wasn't any leadership and um, they would have to merge with the Salt Lake Club. I called to, um, the current president and said, what position do you have left? And it was the president's job and I took on that role. There's not a lot of diversity in the rinks in Utah or like pretty much anywhere. It is really hard. There's not a lot of black uh, people in skating. Very, very few. Isabel surprised me. She has an advantage, I mean, that she's watched her big sister do these things. When you are judged on how good your costume is and you show up with um, things that don't match your skin tone, that's gonna affect how you, you skate mentally because you think, well, I'm already going to get minuses for the fact that my presentation isn't as good as it could be. It makes you feel like you don't belong. When we first started, we looked everywhere to find brown tights that fit her skin tone. The first uh, skating competition she had, like we just couldn't find the right shade, so I bought tan, which was like really Caucasian color, and she was so embarrassed by it. We still haven't found skating gloves, her skin tone. I have to dye them or paint them so that it comes close to matching. Skating is an extremely, extremely um, expensive sport, and I think that's also a barrier. You think, well, there's not enough black skaters in the sport, why should I invest in it? But what if, if you invested, that would help more people feel like they can do the sports? I hadn't realized 
that there's just not a lot of diversity in skating. And so it's just been really fun to see her grow and develop. Skaters, we take a lot of hard falls. I think most of us have tailbone injuries or wrist injuries at some point. I had tried my double axle off the belt for the first time and Kelsey thought I was really close, like I was gonna land it the next day. But then the next day in the morning, I was training off ice and I rolled my ankle. None of my jumps feel as normal as they used to, but slowly but surely we're gonna get back. Cause I'm like landing so early. I remember when she first landed her axle. Her goal was to just land it in competition for the first time. That was probably her worst competition. It was so painful to watch. She fell on every single element possible, but she landed the axle. She landed the, the axle, she reached that goal, and we celebrated. I hope that I can make enough changes, at least in Utah, for people to be more welcoming of the diversity. When I first started, I felt like really lonely. I didn't feel like an ice skater, like part of the ice rink. That is so important for people to see that they're, they belong, they, they can do this. A University of Utah student stepped on a basketball court and by the time he stepped off, the game was never the same. That student Wat Masaka shattered racial barriers in basketball and beyond, leaving a legacy that still inspires young athletes. I think people tend to underestimate Asian Americans, Japanese Americans. We are athletic, we break barriers in history, and Asian American stories are like integrated in US history throughout, but we just don't hear about the stories. I'm Kimari Pern. Um, I'm in 10th grade right now, so I'm a sophomore. I've been playing volleyball since I was in first grade, I think, competitively since I was 11. At first, I wasn't really interested in history. I, it was probably my least favorite subject, but my teacher reached out to me and she asked me, hey, would you be interested in doing this national competition for history? And I'm like, I've never heard of that before, but okay, I'll give it a shot. So I made a documentary for National History Day. It's about Wami Saka, first person of color in the NBA. I'm really interested in Asian American stories because I feel like there's stories that are untold about our history, but are super important. Yeah. And so I was just, looking like famous Asian Americans up and I saw Wami Saka's name come up. And then when I was doing like more and more research, I realized he's not just the first Japanese American or the first Asian American, but the first non-white player in the NBA. And he like broke the color barrier like Jackie Robinson did. And he's from Utah, he's so. He's from Utah, yeah. from Austin, right? Yeah. In history, once you get involved, you're like, you're Yeah, right? Uh-huh. Like it just took one thing and then I was like hooked. When I'm making a documentary, in my head, I can just see the documentary already playing out. <laughs> this is um, Watt when, during a Knicks game, they were recognizing him for being the first Knicks draft pick and um, being the first non-white player in NBA history. They announced it to the whole stadium. That was so cool. So Watt Misako was born in Ogden, Utah. He grew up on the famous 25th Street. He went to Weaver Junior College, which is now Weaver State. He played there. They won the ICAC championships twice. And then he moved to University of Utah. It was there that he won the NCAA championships and NIT championships when he got back from the war. And so it seems like the winning kind of followed Watt around <laughs> wherever he went. In 44, it really was a local team. And, you know, people uh, say, boy, it sure was a fluke that a team from little old Utah could uh, win the national championship. I keep saying that the fluke was in that we had so many good basketball players coming up at the same time from such a small area. I think there are five of the team that signed pro contracts. And uh, the, the whole state went wild. I learned that he was a really good athlete. Um, he earned the nickname Kilowatt for being like so quick, speedy on the court. And I've seen some of the videos. It's crazy how, how quick he is and how good his defense is. When I won my m most valuable player thing was coming across the center, getting the ball coming across the center. 
a lot of them, like myself, would shoot with one foot off the floor. You know, they, they shoot with a little hop. The you shot, sh shot's just about gone. You know, you, yeah, like this. <laughs> what I learned about Watt's story is that he never gave up, even when facing the racism and discrimination going on towards Japanese Americans during World War II. Basically, after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese American U.S. citizens were declared aliens or enemies of the U.S. And so they put them into Japanese internment camps and forced everyone from the West Coast to move inland. I didn't know that my family was like affected by this. I even like didn't know about like my grandpa being in the camp for a while. And there are so many untold stories in history and they need to be shared, especially like Wat Misaka's story or the Japanese internment camps, both things that I didn't like learn about in schools. After we came back from uh, Madison Square Garden where we'd won the, the NCAA basketball championship, and that was the first piece of uh, mail that I, my mother gave me as I stepped off of the train, was my little greetings from the president, uh, inviting me to join the Armed Forces of the United States. He went overseas to Japan while they were imprisoning other Japanese American citizens in these internment camps. It was really interesting to see like that footage from Watt in the camp um, at Topaz. He was visiting though, because he didn't live on the West Coast, so he wasn't incarcerated, but he was representing them by playing basketball. At this time, please direct your attention to the East Rappers for a special presentation as we reveal the battle of Wat Misako. And now a few words from Nancy Umemora. We love and appreciate you more than we could ever say. You know, Wat would have turned 98 last month, and Thank you to the Utah community for supporting Watt and our family for nearly a hundred years. Go Utes! I think Watt Misaka was a very humble guy. Um, in Japanese, it's like being haskashi or like you don't want the spotlight kind of. He was just kind of quietly going on with his life and people just didn't recognize that he was the one who broke the barrier. So Kimura, I'm so touched and thrilled with your project and I'm, I'm we're just very honored um, that you chose to do this on our dad but I did bring a few things that I wanted to show you this is the oh blanket that oh, wow. was given to the 1944 team oh my gosh um, I saw this blanket and you know what was in the a movie about Topaz, mm -hmm. holding it up with, I think... Mas Tatsu. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes. Tatsu. <clears throat> wow, this is so amazing. And then when uh, he was sent to you know, Hiroshima, shortly after the bombing to interview people, he was part of the 5th Air Force, because the Air Force was part of the Army at that time. Yeah, so that was his 5th Air Force patch. This was the jersey that the New York Knicks presented to him. This is like incredible to see like in person. I've watched videos of him like holding that this up at Madison Square Garden or seeing these pictures um, and putting them in my documentary, but to see them like here like physically is just, it's, it's really impactful to see it. I feel like National History Day opened so many doors for me. I've never been so invested in history than I am right now. At the state level, I, won the Glenn and Carol Minor Prize for Utah history. And then I got to go to DC for nationals. <laughs> I wanna be a filmmaker when I grow up <laughs> and I wanna keep doing documentaries. I wanna keep sharing stories. Of course, the through line in all those stories is courage, and we want to know what gives you courage. Head to This Is Utah's Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube pages, hit the like button, leave a comment, and don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, I'm Liz Adiola, and this is Utah. This Is Utah is made possible in part by the Willard L. Eccles Foundation, 
the Lawrence T. and Janet T. D. Foundation, and by the contributions to PBS Utah from viewers like you. Thank you.